Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar. We have a very special guest with us today, Yehoshua Sussman, who is a musician. You see he's holding the violin. Yehoshua, welcome to The Jewish View. Thank you very much. Well, of course, with no secrets there, they see the violin, and you are a musician, and um, you're actually new to the Capital District. People won't know that. I, you just moved in a few months ago. So that's very good. We like building up the Jewish community here. Thank but um, let's let even start with the violin. Why did you pick that instrument, and what's your background, and you know how did you get into music, and what's your, like I say, your educational background in the violin? Um, when I was, believe it or not, four years old, um, my parents wanted to start me on an instrument, and they chose wisely initially piano, and um, I took. A couple of, um, I took almost a year of lessons when I was four years old on the piano, and um, by providence, the um, student before me uh, played violin. Um, my teacher was very um, talented and taught both piano and violin at a high level. So the student before me played violin, and as my <coughs> mother is a pretty punctual person, we got there each week five minutes ahead of time. So I had the opportunity to hear my fellow student playing the violin for five minutes a week. And after a couple of months of hearing that uh, week to week, I asked my parents if I could start playing the violin. And um, <coughs> at first, my, uh, my mother said, no, you, you made a commitment to the piano. Why don't we stick with it? But um, sooner or later, I made another attempt at um, starting violin lessons and after that they couldn't refuse. So I started playing um, the violin a month before my fifth birthday and I um, took lessons in Philadelphia at um, the Settlement Music School which is a, a somewhat renowned um, school in the Philadelphia area um, until I went away to um, Interlochen Music Camp in Michigan. Right. Yeah. I'm from Chicago. I actually been there. So go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you have. Yeah, I visited. My parents wanted to give me culture also, so we went there for <laughs> in the summer over here for a few concerts. Very All good. Right. Um, and I decided when I was at Interlochen that I'd like to uh, push push further in in my education and. I moved to Chicago um, and started taking lessons at Northwestern University. And soon it was time for me to actually enter university. And I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, came back home, and um, studied with several of the the major teachers at the university and went to um, graduate school in Hartford, Connecticut at the Hart College of Music um, where I learned uh, musicology and Baroque violin. Musicology is what exactly? It's not just playing, is the theory of music or it's... Uh, musicology combines um, theory, the history of music, um, also um, historically informed performance where you try to um, you try to uh, perform in as close to the um, style of the <coughs> time that the pieces were written as possible so a, an 18th century piece would be performed in as accurate an 18th century style as one could mm. and um, musicology also um, talks about the influences of one composer on another, um, the different styles of uh, national music, what makes Czech music different from English music, different from French music, and also the, um, the time periods, what makes Baroque uh, music um, unique as opposed to romantic or modern music. Excellent. Um, so you're an accomplished violinist yourself. I mean, you've played in concerts. I mean, or major concerts when in university or um, before they, sure they had their own concerts. I mean, but sure. Um, 
after my undergraduate degree was completed and before I went on to my graduate degree, um, I joined two professional symphony orchestras in Philadelphia, um, one of which was the Philadelphia Virtuosi. And um, we, we toured and we made recordings on the Noxos label, for instance. You could get that in any music store. Um, and also the Haddonfield, New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. Um, that orchestra is the training ground for the Philadelphia Orchestra in and of itself. Um, and so I, I had professional opportunities in Philadelphia, and then I decided to go on to graduate degree. Uh, people are also putting in another, maybe we can connect it to, I mean, obviously you're a religious Jewish person, Yamaka and the beard. Um, was that always the case, and how did you get into that? We asked you, how do you get into the violin? <laughs> now, how do you get into to Judaism? Right. Um, no, I, I, I haven't been um, an observant Jew my entire life. Um, in fact, right around the time that I was graduating from my undergraduate degree in Philadelphia, um, I took a trip to Europe, of all, pla you know, of all places t for one to get into Judaism. Um, and I, uh, I went on a Jewish trip and <coughs> one of the tour guides was a rabbi who was a, for all, uh, he was a relatively observant person and he invited me to uh, the synagogue and to uh, put on tefillin and to, um, to daven during uh, Shabbat services and I had a wonderful time during that three-week trip kind of getting into the ry rhythm of Jewish life. Um, things like uh, Shabbat and, and uh, feeling special that I wasn't allowed necessarily to eat every, everything that was served to me. Um, it gave me um, a unique feeling of identity and uh, belonging. And uh, when I came back to Philadelphia after about two months in um, Europe. You was playing for the violin, I mean like, what were you supposed to be doing in Europe? I mean just well, um, in university course? Or? Actually it was a, it was a um, funded <coughs> trip um, that the German government arranged for American Jewish students to see what the nature of the relationship between the German people and the Jewish people had become over the last mm. 50 years. Um, meanwhile, the whole reason that I went over was so that I could see the homes and the uh, grave sites of the great uh, European composers. Really? Truly. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> I, nobody knew that on the, uh, none of the administration <laughs> knew yeah. that, but that's the real inner reason why I went initially. Right. So now you got into Judaism while you were in Europe, you mean, like just seeing that and... That's right. I mean, you got stronger there. That's right. Uh, when I came back to the United States and um, was finishing up my uh, undergraduate degree in Philadelphia, I um, had missed what I um, observed, what I uh, found in Europe, and um, looked for the closest religious uh, community. Right, excellent. Um, let's maybe start with a little music and then maybe uh, we'll talk about Jewish music. You want to start with a little bit of, like you say, uh, traditional music, like you sing Baroque and Romantic music. I mean, where do you want to, sure. the earliest um, but, uh, Middle Ages to Renaissance? Sure. Uh, why don't I start with a um, a piece by Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, this piece was written in the 1720s. And it's the first movement of a partita in D minor for solo violin. <laughs>
That's excellent. Thank you. Um, you know, on a side note, maybe that, you know, they always talk about how these, since the German composed, I don't know, since, but they were anti Semitic in their other writings, like Beethoven and, you know, Mozart and surely Wagner, you know, that was typical. Do you ever look into it? And if you did, did it ever bother you? You know, what kind of the personalities behind the music? I mean, people talk about it a little bit. Wagner is a known personality, but. You know, they say well, if you really want to know, they're all they were all anti-Semitic. Um, in my uh, musicological studies, as it were, um, I've um, read a lot about the the lives and the opinions and the views of the of the major composers, and um, more often than not, it's a rumor. Oh, really? More often than not. Um, there are some confirmed cases, like Wagner, um, amongst amongst some others, but um, <coughs> most of the um, major composers that we we know and love um, uh, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, um, Brahms these composers um, didn't really have so much of an opinion. They came into um, s some kind of contact with Jewish people, but um, they didn't have a vocal stance like people like Wagner did. That's very interesting because usually the word is, you know, that they wrote about it. The truth is, the matter is, even if, you know, there was a culture then, I mean, a lot of what the English lit, like Shakespeare, Merchant of Venice, it's like there weren't even any Jews in England at that time when he wrote it. It just became, it was just a normal kind of expression maybe that was it it wasn't just out and out anti-semitism was just the way people lived you know sure. <coughs> Jews were separated then from the Gentiles and therefore there was like just a rift between the two but just a natural thing not like out and out anti-semitism so it's interesting so that's <coughs> because usually people you know say that but they, it's like easy to say oh the Germans were anti-semitic right. you know they wanted to say that all right, so when did, um, you say that was from Haydn, to when did he live about, a little bit of uh, bio on him? Sure, um, oh. that, um, that piece was by Johann Sebastian oh, Bach. So Bach. Bach, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Fine. What um, was that, the 1600s? I have to dig up my, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to test me over here as a student over here. <laughs> no, um, it's... 1700s, wasn't it? Yeah, um, Bach was born in 1685. Oh, that was right. Um, he <coughs> passed away in 1750. Um, Bach is such an important figure, and he um, was such a summation of the um, late Baroque period that his um, most music historians, most uh, cultural historians, um, say that the Baroque period in music, in fact, passed with his passing in the year 1750. Um, so when we talk about the beginning of uh, the next period, the next era in um, music history, which is the classical period, we say that the classical period began in 1750, in mm. coincidence with his passing. Um, um, we mostly think of uh, Jewish families, thankfully, um, as having um, a lot of children, which is wonderful. Um, Bach himself had 24 children. Really. Yes, he did, um, and only two wives, um, not at the same time. Yes. <laughs> um, his first wife gave him eight children, and the next, um, 16 children. Um, unfortunately, I think it's either 10 or 11 survived until adulthood. Really? Um, three of whom are some of the most famous composers of the 18th century, um, W. F. Bach, Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, then um, also C. P. E. Bach, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, and um, J. C. Bach, Johann Christian Bach. Oh, I've never even heard of those. <laughs> <laughs> I did take piano, I should say. I took piano for four years also. I played a lot of the... You know, I was a uh, child, so that's why I know a little bit about these music, but, I, you know, about the classics. So, all right, so where do we go from to the uh, classics? Who's, uh, 
one of the classics you'll play for us after Bach? Oh, okay. Um, so, um, Joseph Haydn okay. um, was a composer who was coming of age um, just as um, Bach was, uh, Bach had passed away. Um, Joseph Haydn was born in 1732. And um, he is kind of the quintessential classical period composer. Um, he's called Papa Haydn um, because he has this kind of um, paternal um, association with him in that he exemplified the um, classical period to such a great extent. He's called the father of the symphony and the father of the string quartet. Um, he's probably the most prolific great composer, um, maybe one of them who's ever lived. He wrote 104 symphonies, 68 string quartets. Mm. Um, and this is a, um, a violin concerto in G major, the, the opening movement of the G major violin concerto of Haydn. What was the difference to give us a class on that between the earlier period of the Baroque and the classics? I mean, well, you know, I mean, there's different music, but you know, how would you explain the difference? Um, two major differences that I could talk about quickly um, are, firstly, the fact that in Baroque music, um, phrases <coughs> are built on what are called elisions. An elision is when you have um, one chord or one note that acts both as the last note of the previous phrase and the first note of the next phrase. So it's kind of like a, a springboard, this particular chord. What that gives um, Baroque music is a feeling of spinning or um, constant melody. Um, whereas in the classical period, you don't have this type of technique called elision. Um, what you have are um, phrases and melodies that are um, composed, comprised of small tidbits. They're call, it's like a question and answer. Um, the first um, little tidbit is called the antecedent, and the second is called the consequent. Um, I'll, I can give an example very quickly. So um, one of the most famous of all classical period pieces is the 40th Symphony in G minor by um, Mozart, um, which, believe it or not, um, the last three symphonies, 39, 40, and 41, he wrote in one summer toward the end of his very short life. Um, so this sounds, it sounds like this. a very famous melody. So um, you have right there, th and that's only the first half of the <coughs> first phrase, you have there the antecedent, and then the consequent. Then antecedent, consequent. Let's see what this one yeah. um, The second is that um, especially amongst the, um, the German Baroque composers, um, they used a, a texture called polyphony. That comes from two Greek words. Um, poly is many, and phony is sounds. 
So you have, in this technique, in this texture, um, several melodies that each of which would sound beautiful and full and complete by itself being sounded at the exact same time. So you can have four separate melodies being sounded at the same time. Um, great polyphonists or um, contrapuntalists, they're synonymous words, um, were Johann Sebastian Bach, the, the greatest of all contrapuntalists, um, and um, Handel, and several others, uh, Zelenka. Um, these composers were able to fashion music that sounded like a harmonious whole. Um, meanwhile, each of them has three, four, five melodies sounding at the same time. Then in the classical period, um, composers decided to simplify their music a little bit. And what they um, used is a technique, a texture called homophony, where you have a major, you have a, an important melody, the main melody of the texture, which is accompanied by a, a simple accompaniment, as opposed to another full melody, um, the main melody is equal. Yeah. There are two different structures. Different. Let me ask you one, I remember that um, the Jewish, tied into a little bit, Jewish composer, mm -hmm. I mean, you're the expert and I just know a little bit, but Felix Mendelssohn came on the scene in the late 1700s, was it not? Early 1800s. And, um, I mean, this is a breakthrough for Jewish music. I mean, beforehand, you see any Jewish composers? I mean, it's the only one I know of, that's all I'm saying. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but, you know, to break into the, to the system, so to speak, you know, because usually it was like a closed system, and here was yeah, finally a Jewish person. I mean, later on, Jewish people are big into music over here once they opened up the gates of the ghetto and to the universities. There used to be a lot of... Uh, Jewish composers afterwards, but he was he the first major one? And yeah, um, Felix Mendelssohn, he was born in 1809, um, and he <coughs> is the first um, internationally recognized Jewish composer um, that uh, is still famous today at the very least. You have an opera by um, Jacques Halevi called Le Juif, the, the Jew. Mm -hmm. um, he was born still in the, um, already in the uh, 18th century, in the late 18th century, so he, he predated um, Felix. Mendelssohn, Felix Mendelssohn, by approximately 10 years. <coughs> um, Mendelssohn um, was such an amazing prodigy that as opposed to what um, the public um, who is uh, somewhat familiar with uh, the classics uh, might think that he was even a greater prodigy than Mozart himself. Really? Um, Mendelssohn um, wrote what's considered to be one of the greatest chamber uh, music pieces ever written, his octet, um, when he was 18 years old. Um, the things that Mozart was writing when he was 18 are um, not as accomplished as that piece, for instance. Um, interestingly <coughs> enough about uh, Mendelssohn is that his grandfather was um, a very famous Jewish figure from the 18th century um, named Moses Mendelssohn. Um, and Moses Mendelssohn was a, a German Jew and he was the catalyst for um, the Jewish entrance to the universities in Germany. He was the one who brought it in, his grandson became Felix Mendelssohn. That's right. Do you have anything from Mendelssohn? Yeah, sure. Are um, you uh, calling up, uh, you know, right at the, <laughs> your fingertips? Sure. Um, this is the, um, the second theme from the first movement of uh, Mendelssohn's probably most famous piece, the, um, the Violin Concerto. It could be that Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto in E minor, that's, that could very well be the most famous and 
most popular violin concerto in the world. It very well could be. <laughs> Thank you. You know, uh, Yoshua, the trouble is we're out of time. <laughs> we're having such a good time. Uh, you know, I think I'm just going to have to ask you to come back for part two because there's so much really I wanted to even ask, and I'm sure there's so much more in the violin. So thank you very much, Yoshua Sussman, and we'll stay tuned uh, next week for part two. Thank you. <laughs>